not from you. All right, so uh, this talk is a, is a format where I'm going to be talking a little bit about GTK and about some basic concepts behind it. But then I just want to jump directly into writing a simple application in GTK and you can share, you can see my screen shared. And so, so we can get uh, to discuss the topics in a practical way. Uh, I, in the past, I used to do more uh, slide-based presentations about developing uh, applications, but code on the slide, I don't think it's something that scales very well. So let's do some hands-on and let's take the risk of uh, having bugs on, on a live presentation, right? Because usually that's what happens. Uh, so here are the, the links for my my slides. So if you want to follow the presentation as well, uh, I'm going to be posting them on the chat uh, after the presentation, so no worries about it. So right, um, yeah, you don't need the introduction. You saw my presentation uh, 10 minutes ago. So GTK, the, you know, the GIMP toolkit, right? The, uh, in, the, in the beginning, there was this tool called GIMP. And uh, it was uh, it is an image manipulation program by the GNU project. And the toolkit, the graphic uh, widgets that they use to create that application, uh, has ex has grown, outgrown the project to the point where the whole GNOME desktop has been built on top of it. And this is not a historical talk. There is a very nice history of GNOME uh, video that is a presentation from a previous Guadec that you can find on YouTube. Uh, I also will be posting the link on the chat for those who want to follow up. But yeah, this is not a history project. This is more about a practical practicality one, like how to write an application in, in GTK. So who is using GTK, right? Why would you learn this new technology? Why would you learn this stack? So there, the desktop, the GNOME desktop is developing based on GTK. So the GNOME applications are, and it's available in all the distributions that ship GNOME, Fedora, RHEL, Ubuntu, SUSE, Debian. So everybody who is using these distributions is somehow using uh, a GTK application, is using uh, our code. Uh, also, if you're using Firefox or Chrome or Linux, uh, the windows are also draw using GTK, so they look native, they look compatible with the rest of your, consistent with the rest of your desktop. Uh, we know of Konami, uh, the video game maker company, that they also use uh, GTK for some embedded devices, but since they do something less connected to desktop Linux, uh, we are not very aware of why they do it, but we already spoke to various Konami developers in conferences about their use of GTK. Uh, also, there is .NET, uh, the IDE, like the, the, the development in integrated development environment uh, that Microsoft has with Mono and Xamarin that allows you to create GTK applications and ship them in multi-platforms uh, using .NET. So it's pretty cool, pretty cool. And there is also Steam, Valve. If you're playing games on Linux, you see that the dialogues are also native. They look very uh, compatible with the rest of the desktop. But talk is cheap. Let's continue. Uh, so the key concepts of uh, GTK is the widgets, so the objects on the interface, the containers, which are also widgets, but they are able to contain other widgets, and then the constraints. Uh, the the mathematics involve allocating space between the widgets and all. Uh, GTK is an event-based uh, toolkit in the sense that uh, you need to code thinking of what happens when a person clicks a button. Then you need to connect it to a callback to have a, a reaction to, a, to that event. So this is something that is going to be much more evident with the practical uh, example. Uh, C G object is this uh, implement C implementation of object oriented programming. So you can uh, write object oriented programming uh, applications and libraries using C, which is not an object oriented programming language. And GTK is, uses G object and various other uh, peripheral libraries. Let's say there are, we are going to have an overview of the platform, so that is going to be clear. But the idea of using C is because we can get closest to the low level of the computer and have maximum performance. It also comes with some with some problems because of that, some extra complexity because of that. But there, we also have G-Object introspection that allows us to, in, in, in a simple way to put it, it allows you to call C programs, or so parts of C programs, functions, methods, in other programming languages. So this allows you to write a GTK application in Python, a GTK application in JavaScript, or various other languages. And uh, the libraries are 
C libraries. So you have the toolkit, and it, this toolkit is available in various languages, and which is pretty cool. And GTK has this concept of single thread, so you're also going to see from the, the events that you somehow have multi-threading, but they all have to somehow converge to a, to a single thread. So here, uh, language binding, so languages that you can write GTK applications on. I am sure that there are a few other ones, but uh, these ones are the, the most popular ones, I think, in, from the top of my head. Uh, today, I'm going to be doing the examples in Python, so we don't need to be writing too much code to see the results. But uh, all of the, the, the examples I'm going to do today, uh, you can also do with, other, with these other programming languages. Various GNOME's applications are actually written in Python as well, like GNOME Music. Some are written in C. Uh, in, in JavaScript, there is the GJS, which is the GNOME JavaScript, and there are some very nice applications, like parts of the GNOME shell is written in JavaScript, the GNOME extensions, uh, GNOME documents. Um, Vala GNOME Boxes, the application that I work on, this virtualization uh, client application uh, is written in Vala. And now there is uh, Rust coming over and uh, it's being popular because the bindings are, are, are becoming much more easy to, to, to work with and Rust has a, a lot of advantages over C. So there are a few applications in Rust. You see the GNOME Tour application, the, the, the first one you see on the new version of GNOME that teaches you about uh, the features in GNOME and whatnot uh, is written in Rust. Uh, we also have a, a, a matrix uh, chat application called Fractal that is also written in Rust. So this is also a way for you to, to see that if you have expertise in an existing programming language, you can probably transfer your expertise to our stack and trying to, to, to contribute there. Uh, the GNOME APIs are, are, are in C, so you kind of uh, have uh, to look at the C documentation uh, if you want to have a deep dive of how things are implemented under the hood. So uh, here I, I just put this prefix as snake case so you can see how uh, object-oriented programming concepts get translated into C. So how we have uh, the prefix of the G dash for things, and then we have the name of the object, and then we have the methods, and how this uh, can easily be serialized or can transferred to concepts in, in other programming languages. Uh, uh, GTK also uses heavily of inheritance, so uh, one object uh, inheriting uh, characteristics from another one. So everything starts with this very elementary G object that is the implementation of an object in C. And then you have the GTK widget that is a very elementary widget. And then you have containers uh, that are widgets that can contain other widgets. Uh, the GTK bin is a type of GTK container that can contain one item. And then there's GTK button, which is a type of GTK bin that can contain multiple items and can manage its constraints about size allocation and packing. So you can see that uh, a lot of times uh, things are going to be very simplified because not every widget needs to implement every single concept and all. So this is a concept from object-oriented programming that uh, we use and benefit from in, in GTK. Advantages, the language being language agnostic, being able to write GTK applications in various languages uh, is a great advantage because we can focus on uh, using the right tool to solve the right problem. This is a lesson you, you probably are going to, to conclude by yourself the more you work in, in, in programming that you should use the right tool for the right thing, that there is not such a thing as one tool solves it all and you, if it, not uh, every single a nail can be hammered with the same hammer, right? So uh, the, there is a stability because C has a good performance and uh, it, it's free and open source software. So uh, the cons of using GTK is that we don't have a good multi-platform story. There are some uh, GTK applications in Windows, in macOS, but uh, they are not as well supported as the Linux counterparts. So we are still yet to make a big progress on the multi-platform story. I think that we are progressing very well on that, but uh, we are still not the best toolkit. So if you would be willing to write an application that needs to be in various platforms, I wouldn't necessarily advise you to use GTK. I know of Qt that is used by, by, by KDE that has a bare multi-platform story uh, so far. Uh, yeah, our documentation is still ever growing, and this is also a way you can contribute. You can also contribute to improving the the, the, the GTK documentation. Uh, we are going to have uh, this year on the Google season of docs, a person working uh, during the internship 
in the GTK documentation, in the actual the GNOME developing documentations in general, I believe. So I hope uh, we can improve our documentation. And also with GTK4 coming, uh, we are probably going to spend a lot of time documenting things better. So the, the downsides of GTK uh, might be going away at some point. So if you want to develop desktop applications, which have a, a reasonable amount of uh, uh, to run in a reasonable amount, in a reasonable performing device, so not something very lightweight for embedded devices, but uh, there are GNOME applications deployed in kiosks, for instance, so you you can have machines uh, where people are buying tickets or where you have uh, the timetable for uh, transportation systems that are written based on GTK. Uh, there are various companies uh, doing business out of writing little applications in GTK here and there, so this is also an interesting uh, thing to learn if you are interested in developing desktop applications. Uh, tooling, GTK actually has pretty good tooling nowadays. Uh, Gnome Builder is the IDE that I'm going to use on the examples later on. And it's a complete uh, development environment that is integrated with Flatpak and with toolbox containers. And uh, it's specialized on writing Gnome applications. So you have uh, a few extensions that can help you uh, perform bad, better while you're coding. It's, it's very nice and it's continue being developed. So it just tends to improve. There's also the GTK inspector that I plan to, to show that allows you to interactively, uh, interactively interact with Gnome applications. Uh, we also have Dev Help, which is an application that allows you to read your documentation locally. So you don't need to necessarily browse the documentation on the internet. We have the human interface guidelines. So this is GNOME documentation showing how GNOME applications uh, should look like from a user interface and user experience point of view. So this is very nice to get uh, to get the concepts of how GNOME applications look like, how GTK applications can look better by following certain guidelines, not just in terms of aesthetics, but also in terms of accessibility and uh, performance. And also Glade that allows you to build up interfaces uh, graphically by dragging and dropping and uh, clicking buttons around and you can build a front end for applications that you can just plug to your code. So here is an overview of, of the stack. Uh, Glib is in the very low level and implements very basic uh, elementary, I would say, uh, concepts that are reused on top of the stack. So you, you have... Uh, objects for manipulating date time, for reading files, for uh, manipulating strings. And then you start going up and you have GIO that can do file management with networking involved and these things can be abstracted. So GTK is built on top of this and this is one of the great aspects of uh, free and open source software that uh, things are built on top of each other and we are able to be always constructive and not no need to reinvent the wheel all the time by having your own implementation of everything. And uh, as an application developer, you can be picking uh, the best of each one of them and, and compose your application without having to, to do a lot of things. A lot of people are going to complain about C and insecurity and, and all, uh, but the, the, the reason it was chosen, it need to be taken into a context of the time it was chosen uh, and also the advantages of it that uh, uh, it's very flexible, it's very popular. The Linux kernel is written in C, so you are able to talk to directly to, to various elementary libraries on your operating system because of C, the compatibility is there. So uh, I don't see this changing much uh, for a library point of view, but there is already a lot of discussions about rewriting some applications in Rust. Uh, I know Federico has been working on libRSVG that renders images in GNOME uh, to port it to Rust, and he has already made a release out of it. So things are moving there. And uh, so you don't, if you have some traumas from university from C, or you find C to be very hard to learn, uh, it's not necessarily going to be always like that. And as I said, the applications you build on top of it uh, can be available in various other languages. But if you want to actually contribute to GTK itself, so improve the toolkit, to improve GLE, to improve GIO, to improve these components that build GNOME applications, you might have to, to, to dive into C. So that's that. I <laughs> will uh, probably skip this slide because it's about signals and event handling. And we have uh, examples of that on the application that I'm going to be showing you. 
So uh, it's basically that GNOME has, uh, GTK has signals in the sense that you can connect to events emitted by a widget. So when a button gets clicked, you can emit the clicked signal and then there's a whole hierarchy of widget propagation. So one widget contains another one. Our toolkit is based on containers. So it's one window that contains a content area that contains another widget and so on. So there's a whole uh, system of propagation of signals from the widgets that uh, emitted the signal all the way up to whoever is going to handle that signal. So this is something very nice uh, to develop applications in a very manageable way, in a very modular way. So here I have some link for some resources. Uh, the GTK and uh, the Human Interface Guidelines and various other guides are available on developer.gnome.org. So there you can find various other guides about developing GNOME. And here I have a link to the Python GTK uh, docs that uh, we're going to be using on the examples now. So if you want to, if you are a Python person or if you want to follow along, that's uh, something nice to check. And uh, and then the, we have the IRC channels where we have the newcomers one where we usually help people starting contributing. And then the GTK one when it's more specific things to the toolkit itself. So if you want to, to get to know a detail about implementation or discuss why something is the way it is with the GTK developers, uh, you can find them there on the irc.gnome.org uh, server on IRC. So just a second for me to set up here my my environment to start uh, sharing my screen. So it's demo time. I hope screen sharing works. Yeah, so you should be seeing my screen now. So I'm going to go to another uh, workspace and I'm going to use GNOME Builder uh, to write a simple application and we're going to be discussing these topics and the development model while we do it. I know it's very risky to, to do a live coding se session, but uh, why not? <laughs> so I am going to be creating a web browser and show you how it's very easy to create a web browser using GTK and WebKit. And also uh, the application ID, uh, let's not get too much into the details because the thing is that you need to be able to somehow learn when is the right time to deep dive into a concept and to abstract and accept the, that it is the way it is and focus on getting our things done, right? So uh, the application ID has this reverse DNS notation. So it's like org.gnome in case of a GNOME application, but you would probably have your own domain for your own applications. But I'm going to call it org.gnome browser because it's a web browser and uh, it's in Python. Uh, the license uh, here you can pick. The whole thing about this is that Builder is going to create a, a, a boilerplate, like a, a basic template of how a Python project should look like. So we don't need to worry about setting up the beginning of the project, like the build system or the very the very elementary parts of your application. We can focus on actually developing the, the, the real functionality. So now uh, I, I created an application with Builder. You can see here. Uh, the files of this uh, application, and uh, I am just going to modify uh, the build system to build against the latest GNOME, so we have a modern way. So this is a, a Flatpak application, so your application is already building in a Flatpak container, it can already be distributed this way. So Builder is really handy on in the sense that allows you to just focus on getting things done and not focusing on, on the bureaucratic part of the development, which is bootstrapping the application. I'm just going to go up and check a little bit in the chat if there's any issues. So uh, are you folks able to see my, my screen sharing? Yes, you can see your screen, yes. And you see GNOME Builder here, like with the code? Yes. I, oh, OK, yes. great. OK, that was, hopefully I wasn't talking to myself. <laughs> OK. So the application is done and Builder has this button here in the top, I hope you can see, that is also going to be triggered by Ctrl F5. So I'm going just to press play here and uh, it's going to build in a flat pack, uh, the application a flat pack container is just going to launch it. So now we have a, a Hello World application, it's just a basic GTK window. With, Hello uh, Felipe, someone is saying that I, I, I am only seeing the demo time. 
on the chat. Um, I don't know if everyone is um, seeing this. Yeah, I don't know about that because I can see my screen on the. Oh, okay. So some people see the code, so it might be a specific issue with somebody. Mm. So let's ask: What is the device the person is using? Is, it, is the person using a laptop or a mobile phone? Yeah. So yeah, I hope this is going to be recorded so later on uh, the person who's not able to see the code can can catch up. I guess. So. Uh, I, I will continue. So now we just have this little application with the window and the hello world, and we're going to start modifying it to turn into a web browser because we're developing here a, a web browser. Um, Builder has this search bar here on the top where I get to open the file. So I'm going to open the main window file. There's two files, a window.py, which is the logic of the program, and a window.ui that is the describing the interface. The separation between interface and code is very important to allow designers to work on, on the interface without having to touch the code, and also for you to be able to separate the logic of uh, graphic things and uh, the logic of, of the program, the controller logic of your application itself. So if I open the Python example here, I'm going to raise the font. You see the GNOME Builder already created a file with the license on top and gets my name there and all. Here you have Python uh, importing GTK. And here we have this annotation, this GTK template annotation that points to a resource path. This is that other file that I mentioned, the one that describes the interface. So this annotation pretty much uh, means that this class, this browser window class, is going to have a template mapped to it that is described on this window.ui file. So here we are initializing the template, and here we have a label. So I'm going to probably open both files side by side so we can see how they, they connect, how they interact. So Builder also allows me to put files side by side like this. So let me reduce the font here. Yes. So now you see here that we have a label and a GTK template child, which means that we are mapping this uh, label object to a label presented defined on the, the window.ui file. So this is mapped to this object here. There's the label ID. So if I change here to hello Gnome Africa, and then I hit the play button, I should see the application modified. So it's that simple. And this is an XML notation that is very easy for people who are experienced with HTML, I guess. So let's continue here. <laughs> Uh, what I'm going to do to create a web browser is firstly, I'm going to add the web view. Uh, in a normal, typical browser, you have this big part where the website appears. This is the web engine. It's what renders the HTML of the pages and shows you the visual result of it. So I'm going to add a GTK box, and I'm going to call it content area. And this is uh, exactly what is going to contain this, uh, this web view. So I'm going to remove these aspects that are related to the label, and I'm just going to keep the box. So here we have a GTK box of name content area that is going to be used in our Python program. So let's get here to the Python program on the left and rename this to content area. All right, so now we have a box. Our application no longer has the hello world. I'm going to run it again so we can see if things uh, are working. Yes, so it's an empty space here. So now let's get a browser engine there. Uh, WebKit is the browser engine that GNOME applications use. If you use GNOME Web, the GNOME browser, you're going to see it. And uh, Safari in macOS also uses uh, WebKit to render pages. I think Chrome was using it at some point. I'm not entirely sure if they're still using it. So here you see the GNOME Builder can already complete the name of the library. So that's pretty neat. So let's uh, quote. I'm going to create a uh, an object called web view that is a webkit web view object and then i'm going to get our content area object there in the top to to pack that to add that uh, the web view so here uh, i'm using the gtk object pack start content area is a gtk box so uh, let me show you the the, the python documentation about GTK box. So if I go to GTK box here, you can see the properties, the, the widget hierarchy, the methods. So we are using this pack start one. 
to, to, to add the web view into our box. So here you can see that the first parameter it gets is the child widget. The first one is whether the child widget should expand the box that contains it, whether it should fill the content of it. And here's a padding, a distance to the, the widgets uh, surrounding it. So I will uh, add the, the web view to the content area. I'm going to allow it to expand. I'm allowing it to fill, to fill the, the, the space. And I'm going to let a zero padding. That's it. Uh, Next, I'm going to tell the web view to load uh, to load a page. Let's get to the documentation of WebKit here in the in the browser. So WebKit web view. Nice. So here we have the very same equivalent page for the WebKit. You see the hierarchy for the web view and all. So we want to find out how to load. So I think there is a method called load URI. That's it. A lot of programming is about searching pages, searching in Google. Don't expect that you one day will remember everything because that's really not the point. So don't worry about memorizing things. Worry about how how to get around, like how to get your ideas and how to solve one problem at a time, how to make it in an incremental way. And don't need to focus much on memorizing things. So load URI receives a string, which is the URI, URI, URL that actually we are rendering. So I'm going to open the GNOME website. I'm gonna tell all those widgets to show all, to present themselves, because the widgets, they have this property called visibility. Here you can see on the right side, on the GTK box, that there is a visible true. So when I say here, show all, I'm saying that all the widgets that belong to this application window object, uh, I want them to set the visibility to true. I want to, to show everything. You can also be specific about which ones you want to show, which ones you want to hide. But since this is just a demo application, I'm going to just show you the basics. So let's uh, render our application here. So it's opening. Here in this part, we are supposed to see uh, the GNOME web page loading, you see? So here we have a GNOME website already working. So it was that simple. But, uh, oh, oops, I clicked outside. I'm just going to go back to the chat to see if everything is OK, if I'm not just talking to myself. Yes, it seems that it's all fine. All right. So what else uh, shall we want for a, for a web browser? I think it's important to have a, a, a place for me to type the next uh, address, right? I want to be able to go to a, to a different page, not just to, to have to build my application every single time to, to just browse the, the, the internet. So here at the top, we have this GTK header bar. Header bar is this top bar here you see on the top of the GNOME applications. Various GNOME applications have this bar here in the top, which have other widgets on it. So it's a container. It's a type of GTK container. So I am going to remove the title of it, and I'm going to add a child widget to it. And this child widget is going to be a GTK entry, which is a GTK widget that uh, ent receives text. So here I'm defining the object and I'm setting it to be visible. Oops, there's a typo here. Setting it to true. Oops. Right. So let's build again and see if it appears. I think it's important to go incrementally step by step while you are building your application because if you just sit down and type, 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 and then you run, uh, it might be much harder to find uh, where your bugs start. So you see here in the top, we already have a, uh, a, a bar. But I, I'm going to type everything here. And it's not going to do anything because it's not connected. There is no programming logic behind it. It's just a visual element in the screen. So now we need to actually connect it, do things with it. Uh, before we do it, let's uh, expand it. Let's make it uh, fill the whole space there so we don't have a small one. Because real browsers have a big bar on the top. And we want to have a browser that looks professional. <laughs> so I'm going to tell it to expand. So H expand means horizontally expand. These are all properties from GTK widgets. So we can go here to the documentation and uh, check GTK widget. And uh, let's see what's the properties that they have. Uh, properties. So there are various things you can, you can tweak about widget. Here's the one I just said, expand, whether the widget wants more horizontal space. So it just receives a Boolean value, so it's either true or false. So let's check it out. I just said expand here, and I'm going to run. There you go. Now you see that it's 
it, it has grown. The GTK header bar has uh, three containers inside of it. So it has like the left part, the center part, and then the right part. I want this to be very center. So I'm going to specify the child type of it. So I'm going to tell the header bar that this child widget that uh, it contains is the title one, is the one that is centered. So uh, I think I should probably express it by saying child type and title. Be aware that I really don't know these things by head. So yeah, there we go. This worked. So now the bar is all over the place. But as I said, we didn't connect it. So nothing's going to happen if I press enter in here. If I type anything, nothing happens. Let's uh, connect it to the code. For me to be able to talk to it, to do things with it on the Python part of the code, I am going to assign a user uh, a identif identification name to it. So I'm going to put here URL entry, I guess. I think that that's a pretty standard name. So now I need to have it defined here as a template child. So I am able to uh, talk to this object, to interact with this object. And uh, this uh, GTK entry must have a signal that does something when a person press enter, because it's very useful for you to type something on an entry and press enter and just uh, submit that change, right? So let's check the signals it has. And that's uh, how I'm going to abort the signal, the event-oriented programming. So here we have the activate signal. The activate signal is emitted when the user hits the enter key. So it's exactly what we're looking for. So the activate signal is emitted when the user hits the enter key. While the signal is used, a key byte signal is also commonly used by application to intercept activation of entries, all right? So there are two ways I can connect this URL entry. I could just simply say URL entry connect and connect to a callback to another function that is going to do something when that signal is emitted. But I can also connect them directly from the, the UI file. This is very nice to be able to simplify the Python part of it. So I can say here signal name equals activated. So when the signal is activate, the handler is going to be a function, a Python function in my program. So I'm going to call it, oh, my cat appeared. <laughs> Let me just put him down. So the handler is going to be on URL entry activated. I'm going to call it this way. So this is just us naming things, right? <laughs> so I'm going to create a Python method here that is going to be URL entry activated. It's going to receive, firstly, a reference to the object. And let's see what's the arguments it gets. So the parameters is uh, a GTK entry itself. So it's just the entry. How do this callback get connected from the UI file from the Python code? There is also an annotation for that. Uh, the annotation is GTK template callback. So this uh, defines, uh, makes this method here map to the definition on the UI file on the other side. So what I want to do is that when once I, I the person activates it, once they press enter, I want to tell the web view to load another page. So uh, what's the, the content of the, of, of, of the entry? I'm going to call it URL. And I'm going to get entry, get text. So another time, we're going to go to GTK entry and check for its methods. Get text. There you go. So it returns a string that it has the, the content of the, the entry. So we are going to just feed the string to this method that we saw above, the one that loads the URI. So the same one that we saw here on line 34, we are going to be using here on 41 to load the page. Let's try this. So the application is here. Let's let the GNOME page load. Nice. So let's type another website now. I'm going to type uh, my personal website. Press Enter. You see, we don't have a loading widget yet, so you're not going to see the feedback of things uh, necessarily. But you see that it works, right? There is another page that loaded there. We could try loading uh, google.com. So we already have here google.com. So it already works. So before we move forward to the next feature that we're going to implement uh, on our browser, uh, is everybody following up? Or is everybody seeing my screen and all? Yes, I am following up, and I am seeing your screen. Oh, amazing. So let's add more buttons to our interface. Let's make it much better. Uh, 
browsers have history, right? You are able to go forward and back uh, on a web page, right? So let's add a back button to our header bar. I want it to be on the left because that's how I have it on Firefox. So I'm not a designer, so I'm not going to be opinionative about how things should look like. I'm just going to do it what most people do. So I'm going to add a GTK button here. And uh, I'm going to set it to visible already. And uh, I want this button to have an image on it. So I'm the button is also a container. So it can have a text, but it can also have another widget inside. So another widget that I'm going to add is an image. So I'm going to add a child to my button and create a GTK image on it. So let me close it here. I usually close the tags manually because I'm using v Vim while programming, but now I'm using uh, you know, Builder, so it can close it to me for me as well. So it's very convenient. And uh, the, the GTK image must have a property that tells us what's the image that we're going to use. So GTK image, uh, let's see the properties. So there's a file, so I can pass it a file. There's icon name, so I can pass it an uh, icon name that belongs already on the toolkit. So GTK also has some icons that it, it, it contains. So the, these are icons that uh, GTK applications normally reuse. So you see Firefox is GTK, and we have here these buttons on the top. These are likely GTK buttons. So let's uh, use icon name. So it receives a string. How do I find out the name of the icon? So I'm going to open a terminal. Actually, let me open a, a separated terminal here so I can. Uh, I am using Fedora Silverblue as a distribution, so uh, I, I need to use containers for developing. Oh, I actually don't have a container. <laughs> so let me create one, and hopefully this is going to be fast. Yeah, it's not going to be fast. Anyway, so uh, there is an application called GTK. Uh, image uh, viewer, I believe, that, no, GTK icon browser, I believe, that uh, has a catalog of the icons on, on GTK. Uh, I just happen to, to know exactly what's the name of the icon, so until that loads, I'm going to go ahead and so we don't need to wait. So uh, the icon that uh, is the arrow that goes back, so the same arrow that Firefox has here on the top that goes to the back, uh, it has a name of that is called Go Previews Symbolic, I believe. There are variants on the on the image. So if I just do Go Previews like here, and save and check the result of your of the application, you see the button here. This one is a colored button with details. There is even some shadow on it. But the one that Firefox was using, it's a symbolic one. It's the one that uh, is much more simple. So let me try to add the symbolic prefix to it. I'm going to view it again. Yeah, you see that it looks much more like the Firefox one. Of course, when I click, nothing happens. Uh, so let's connect this button. So the button has a signal. The same way the, the, the GTK entry we saw before has a signal when you press Enter that is called Activate, the button must have another signal that happens that, that gets to trigger when I, when I do some action on it. So let me check GTK button and see what signals it has. So it has the activate signal, has the click signal, and then there's this enter leave. What about uh, when the pointer enters the button? You see here is deprecated, so we shouldn't be using new code. So we are going to ignore it. The click one here is very self-explanatory on the name. So when the button has been activated, pressed, or released, so when it's clicked, and then it receives the parameters, uh, the button itself. So let's implement that. Uh, so we are going to create here a signal. The name is going to be clicked. And the handler is going to be on uh, previous button clicked. So yeah, this is me again being very creative and naming things. <laughs> so it's another callback. So we are going to copy just like the previous one. Callback. It's a Python method. It's going to receive self and then the button. Uh, WebKit Web View needs to do something once the button gets clicked, right? We want to, to tell the web view to, to go back in its history. Web, the, the web view is, is also keeping history for us. So this is also some logic that we don't need to have on our own application, but web view can do, the web view can do it for us. So let me check the WebKit web view documentation. 
and see how I can go back in history. So I'm gonna find a method to go back, something like go, oh, there's one called go back and another one called go forward. So that's very convenient. So go forward and go back. Let me click here on the go back definition. So it loads the previous history item. You can even monitor it by connecting to this load chain signal. So that's pretty cool. Let's just do the go back. So once the button gets clicked, we tell the web view to go back. Right. I hope it works. I didn't save here on the site. Builder told me. Yeah, so let's run. So here we have an application. Let's let it uh, load the GNOME page. I'm going to add my website again because I want. <laughs> And now let's try clicking the button. So I click the button and we are back. So this works. Uh, one thing you probably noticed is that I got back to the GNOME uh, web page, but the URL still here shows the, the website that I typed. So this is not synchronized between the web view and the GTK entry. So this is another feature that our application needs. It's very uh, undesirable to have something like this, right? So. Uh, since we are already here on the web view, let's see its uh, properties because it must have a property that keeps track of the URI, right? So here we have the, the this one that it's a property that's called URI, is a string, and pretty much just uh, returns the value of the current page. Another great thing about GTK is that you can connect to properties and uh, connect a callback to when the property gets modified. So there is a notification system for, for GeoObject properties. So I can pretty much say that um, I want my web view to call a callback once the URI changes. So this syntax here, notify with the, the true semicolons, is uh, how I am able to tell uh, GTK that I want to notify I'm able to tell Jobjack actually that it's the what implements properties in, in, in objects. Uh, when this property changes, I want to connect to a callback. So let's call the callback uh, URL changed. Again, creativity. <laughs> so so dev uh, URL changed. So when the URL changed. Uh, let's see if the callback, uh, yeah, it's probably not going to have anything. Uh, I want uh, the, the entry text to be the web view URI. I think that this is kind of easy, right? So maybe let's go make it very easier by having a, a URL uh, variable here and then passing it as the text to the entry. Hope it works. Let's try. So I'm building it, okay. So it doesn't seem to be working because I already see that the GNOME page loaded and the URL didn't change. So this is probably likely because this method here doesn't have the right parameters about it. So the parameters of a property is probably the source object that caused the change, and then the the, the event, the, the widget itself, right? So I'm gonna call it widget. We're not gonna be using this, so just that Python requires you to specify the parameters. So I suppose that that's why. Well, still not. So maybe let's check the logs. Why is that? Here you have a lot of logs from WebKit, right? Because WebKit oh, entry is not defined. Oh, of course. So you see, live coding has these things. Uh, the the URL entry is the one we are talking about, actually, and it's a object property. So we need to prefix it itself. I haven't been using Python lately. I'm sorry. <laughs> so let's try again. So we are building and yes, the URL appears over there. So now if I go to, if I go to my website, the URL doesn't need it to change, but if I go back, it changed. So another functionality we did. I'm gonna check the chat because I've been talking and staring at my screen. Yeah, it seems like everything is fine. Please let me know if you stop seeing my things because I am really just looking at the code. Uh, let's add another button. Uh, the, the previous button goes to the back, so we should definitely be able to go on that goes forward. So I can go back and, and forward on the, on, the, on the history. 
So I'm just gonna copy this button and just modify it because programmers are lazy, right? So I'm gonna modify here the signal to on previous button click it to on next button clicked. And the image, it's called next. So these very basic no modifications are already going to add the button there. Since we are here already, let's already connect the button because the logic is going to be very, very similar to the one above. So self button web view go and we need to find out what is the method that web view uh, has for going forward. We saw that there was a go back and then there is a go go forward. Uh, so forward. it's very literal. <laughs> Go forward. Let's give it a go. All right, so the URL is here. I'm going to change it to something else. So I'm going to get back to the GNOME web page and then I'm going to get back to my website. So this works. There's something weird about these buttons being far away. You see here in Builder that these buttons are connected. And if you go also to Firefox, you see that they are, are like nicely allocated. So GNOME, uh, or GTK actually, has uh, containers, right? And uh, all the widgets, they can be somehow styled with uh, CSS, just like in the web. So GNOME already has a, a set of uh, CSS selectors that are preset uh, uh, CSS classes that uh, you might want for your objects. So this might not make much sense for you listening to, to this now, but uh, it's going to be very obvious when I, I show you the example. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to create an extra container, a GTK box, that is going to contain these buttons that we have, the, the previous and the forward button. So it's going to have these buttons as child widgets of it. So I'm going to identify here, I guess identity is the word. <laughs> and then I need to close uh, the object. This object itself is a child of the header bar, so we also cannot define it here. We need to define it with one more level of identification. So to just res to just simplify what I said, uh, I just created a GTK box and I just wrapped these two buttons that we had before inside of it. The reason why I did that is because now I want to be able to use a selector to the box that is going to apply to it. So I'm going to use a style and I'm going to assign a class name to it. Uh, you can Google for GTK CSS uh, selectors, I suppose to find out uh, how CSS is defining in GTK and how you can refer to widget properties and to widget themselves, what are the CSS selectors and all. Uh, but uh, there is one uh, class that I already know that is called the linked one. And it has a very interesting uh, effect on the, the widgets that are inside the box. It pretty much says that the, the widgets inside the box, they should be glued together, they should be linked. So let's see the effect of that. I just created a box and then just assigned to it the class linked, the CSS class linked. So you see now the buttons are connected in a much more stylish way. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to show you a very interesting tool. That is the GTK Inspector. The GTK Inspector allows you to interactively click on UI elements on your application and uh, interact with it, the GTK properties. So uh, what I'm going to do is that I, I just have here a shell session inside of my Flatpak sandbox that has this application. I'm going to tell GTK Debug Interactive, and I'm going to run this Python application uh, directly. Uh, I probably need to define a display variable here. Yeah, there you go. Um, oh, OK, so my GTK is not built with uh, enable debug. Yeah, so unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to show the specter because I am using it. I GTK that it wasn't made with it. But anyway, uh, the GTK Inspector allows you to just click on the elements of the interface and interact with them. So you are able to change the, the expand, the alignment, all these properties that we've seen here on the, the documentation, specifically about the GTK ones. So I would be able to click on a GTK entry and change it, its properties, just like the, 
the um, the inspector that browsers have, right? I think in, in Firefox, if you have Ctrl Shift I, you have also an inspector that you can click on things and see its properties. So GTK also has one. Unfortunately, I cannot show it. Uh, yeah, this is one of the problems with uh, live demos that some things not go as as expected. But yeah, this is a simple web browser application. Uh, another like other simple features that are, that one can can implement on it, for for instance, would be for the buttons to be uh, only clickable when there's actually an action to be made. So if the browser already opened GNOME.org and there is no history to be made, the buttons are kind of dummy. So making the buttons unable to be clicked until we have a history would be a next feature to implement. Uh, having tabs would be something nice to implement. And then you can check other widgets that GTK has, like GTK Notebook that allows you to create tabs for your application. Uh, we can have refresh button. We could have some menus over there. So it's up to your creativity and to explore the GTK applications. Another practice that I do quite, quite often when I'm developing is uh, to just go to other code bases of existing GNOME applications and just check how they do it. So you know you are developing a Python application that you can most easily go to GNOME Music that is written in Python and see uh, how they implement certain things. Usually, git grep for the name of the concept you are looking for is a very easy way to get it out. So let's say that we are developing here uh, the application window. So maybe let's see how the application window looks like for GNOME Music. So you see that there is a definition here in this file. So I'm going to open this file. So here you have the GNOME Music Real implementation. You see that it's much, much more complex than what we have, but at the same time, it's very similar, right? We have here the template annotation connecting the two files. We have the class definition initialized. We have the object properties here that are getting mapped from the UI file. And then the init, that is the things that get executed once this object is instantiated. You see here some signals being connected and all. So you see that it's very trivial to, to develop graph applications in this constructive way when you are starting with a very simple, small concept and then you are interactively adding features to it. So I hope you folks felt inspired for writing uh, applications. Uh, we have, as I said, uh, interesting guides you can find on developer.gnome.org. Developer uh, you can uh, you can have the various guides about specific libraries, but also API references, in this case, the C implementations of them. But here in the side, you see links for various language bindings. You also should feel very welcome to join the GNOME communities and talk to the developers and and ask questions. We have the newcomers channel, as I mentioned on the, on the slides before, that um, that is for helping with issues such as this one. And also in the GTK one, if you want to talk to the developers of GTK directly. So yeah, I hope I didn't talk too fast. I hope uh, you felt uh, not bored about uh, looking at the code. It's, I see that it can be boring for some, but I, I hope to see a lot of GTK applications over there because it's so easy to do it one nowadays. Like this application that I developed just now, uh, it's already on a flat pack because GNOME Builder already bootstrapped the flat pack uh, manifest for it. So I can already compose a, a flat pack file that I'll be able to share this bundle with my friends. And I also will be able to simply publish this manifest on flathub.org. There is this website where flat pack applications are, are distributed. So if you are creative about creating your own text editor, your own web browser, your own music player, image manipulation programs, name it, uh, it's very doable to do with GTK and you can do it in your language of your choice because we support various languages. So yes, I I think that that's all and I hope you're not tired of hearing me <laughs> talking for so long. I guess I could take some questions or comments. Wow. Uh, hello. Hi, I can hear you. Yeah. I still want, like, okay. it looks very simple to get started with uh, Python and GTK uh, library. Okay, so I hope everyone uh, gets to learn how to view the web browser with uh, the GNOME uh, library. Okay, so we're moving on. Uh, yeah, so. We have Molly and uh, Rosanna now active. And uh, we're moving on to uh, 
your presentation. Okay, so while we get them ready, if you have any question, you can drop it and uh, Felipe is going to respond to it. Hello, so Felipe, when you say any language, you mean like even web developers can, can use the website and uh, build some application? Yes, exactly. Uh, you can, the same things that we develop now with Python, it would be very easy to make in C or in Vala. I guess if I could, for instance, uh, share my screen here very quickly. I could show you how GNOME Builder can uh, easily, I hope you are seeing my screen now, yeah. So GNOME Builder can, I'm going to close it and start a new one. So GNOME Builder can start a new application and in any of these languages here. And if you want to do something in a language that is not one of these, you also are, are most likely able to do so, but these ones are the ones we have the preset configurations. So you could still achieve the same thing by writing a JavaScript application. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for watching the talk. Okay, so if uh, you have more questions, you can unmute yourself and ask your question, please. And I can also be answering questions on the chat if you prefer to write, no problems. So someone is asking on the chat, uh, his goal, Patrick, how do you get to contribute to genome without coding? Yeah, so uh, on the Etherpad, I pulled some links. Uh, I'm going to post the Etherpad link again on the chat because it's probably in the back. Uh, so in the Etherpad, I have some links about uh, how to contribute design, translation, documentation. And Christy and Regina also mentioned in their previous presentation about how to contribute to engagement. So the links on the Etherpad are a good start point to, to how to find out how to contribute to get on in various fronts, not just code. Okay, thank you. <laughs>